Today's video is about the use of Fleming's left-hand rule and magnetic fields in motors and generators, which is something that comes up very frequently, although not specifically mentioned in our specification. It's an application of several of our specification points. And I thought the best way of illustrating this was to use a motor that was actually given in a question and then work our way through. I'll explain first of all if it's used as a motor and then if it's used as a generator and we'll look at a couple of questions that involve the use of motors. So, the laws that we're going to be applying here is this one, f is equal to b i l, and of course there's a sine theta n there if it happens that the conductor is not perpendicular to the field, which is not the case here, so we can ignore the sine theta. And then Faraday's and Lenz's law, which is that the EMF generators is equal to minus dn phi dt. So let's start with the motors, and I'm going to label this diagram to help explain. First of all, let's add in the magnetic field lines. So the magnetic field lines are running across like this, and remember, from north to south. So when you use Fleming's left-hand rule, which of course you're going to have to use here, remember that your first finger, your index finger, points along the direction of that field from north to south, the same direction that the arrow is in. I'm then going to label the sides of my coil here side A and B, and this is always a great idea when you're answering a question because then it makes describing what is going on much easier. And we'll call the other side CD. And let's put some current through this coil. So the first thing we're going to do is look at a motor, and of course with a motor you supply the current, you supply the field, and you get the force on the wire on either side. So our current is going to run this way. One thing to note, the side BD here, we've got current running along the side BD, but it is parallel to the field lines, and therefore we're not going to get any force, because of course the angle between the current and the field is zero, meaning that F is equal to BIL sine theta, that all multiplies up to zero, so we get no force. So we don't have to worry about those sides. Now let's focus on side AB to start with. If we apply Fleming's left-hand rule, pointing your index finger to the left, remembering towards the field is a little awkward, the second finger points in the direction of the current, so that your middle finger points in the direction of the current, and then your thumb points in the direction of the force, which means we're going to experience a force upwards there. And if you do the same thing to the side CD, you'll see you experience a force downwards on the other side. Now that force is perpendicular to the field, because with Fleming's left-hand rule, we have three perpendicular quantities, the field, the current, and the force. And a motor is designed so that it is perpendicular and you get a perpendicular force. Now what this force is going to do is cause a moment around this axis. And we're going to get the side AB moving upwards and the side CD moving downwards. The only problem is that's as far as it's going to go with the current running in those directions in the wire. And of course, we want the motor to continuously spin. So what we do is we add in, and this should be familiar to you from GCSE, what's called a split ring commutator down on this end. And the split ring commutator just allows the current to reverse every half turn. And so what happens is once the side AB gets up to the top up here, the split ring commutator changes the direction of the current and then causes the current to move in the opposite direction. So by the time AB gets to the top, the current then switches to the opposite direction on each side. And of course, when it's in the opposite direction, it experiences downward force until it gets right down here to the bottom, and then the current switches again, it experiences an upward force, and you get the continuous spinning. So that's how the motor works. Let's look at this in terms of how it would work as a generator. And what I've done is I've removed all of, of the extra information, but left the field lines in, because the field lines are very important. And I've added up here a little handle 
The handle is just there to represent that something must turn the coil, so you're not actually providing current here. What you're doing is you're turning the coil physically, and usually it is connected to something like a turbine. So think of a wind turbine, for example. The wind turbine would be physically attached on the end of that axis, and the wind turbine is what would spin the coil. Now, most commonly, wind turbines are actually attached to magnets, and the magnet spins inside a coil, but the effect is the same because it's relative motion between the field and the coil. Let's look at this particular example. So, something spins that coil. If we look at the flux linkage, so at the moment, there is actually no flux linkage with this coil. None of the field lines are passing through the area of the coil. The area of the coil being that shaded area in green there. So at the moment we've got no flux linkage, but imagine when you spin it, what happens when the coil becomes vertical and it is totally perpendicular to those field lines. Then you're going to have maximum flux linkage up here. So as you spin the coil, you go from no flux linkage right here to maximum flux linkage, back to no flux linkage, and so on. So as it turns, there's a change in the flux linkage, and that's the key to electricity generation, a change in the flux linkage. And of course, the change goes from zero to maximum and from maximum to zero, so we get an opposite change every quarter turn of the coil. And that means, of course, that we're going to get an AC EMF induced in this coil. And that is what in is induced, remember. It's EMF that is induced. If you then make this a full circuit by putting a bulb in there and connecting it all with wires, then you're going to get a current and the bulb will light. And we'll come back to all the details that go with that later. Something that's very helpful to look at is to try and graph what your flux linkage might look like. So if we put flux linkage and time, it could just as easily be flux linkage against the position of the coil. When the coil is horizontal, and let that be our starting position, we've said we've got no flux linkage. And then after a quarter turn, when it's maximum, we've got our maximum flux linkage. It comes back to zero when it goes horizontal again, and then it comes back to maximum, but in the opposite direction, and so on. So we end up with a flux linkage graph like this. Now remember that the EMF generated is the rate of change of flux linkage. The magnitude of the EMF is the rate of change of flux linkage. And also remember, we've got our little lenses law minus in there. So let's focus on rate of change of flux linkage. As you know from your studies in mechanics, that the rate of change of flux linkage is going to be the gradient of the flux linkage graph. So if we look at the gradient of the flux linkage here, we can see very clearly what the magnitude of the EMF would be. So you're going to have maximum EMF here at the start and zero EMF because you've got zero gradient there. Let's see if we can plot that on a graph. So using the same axes, we know that we're going to have a max value when the n phi is zero. But remember the negative. So although we have a max positive gradient here, we're going to have a max negative EMF going to zero, going to max ne negative gradient, but max positive EMF at that point, back to zero again, and then back to max negative. So our EMF ends up looking like that. What this tells us, and something that is quite difficult for people to visualize without a graph like this, is that when the coil is horizontal, the axis of the coil is parallel to the field lines. That's where you get your maximum EMF being generated, because that's where the rate of change is greatest. Basically, our n phi or flux linkage is zero, so any movement of that coil leads to an increase in n phi, and therefore that's the greatest rate of change. When the coil is vertical, the side of the coil is basically moving parallel for a moment to the field lines. So the movement produces very little change in the flux linkage, and so that's where our EMF being generated is zero, just as we can confirmed by using the graphs. So the graphs are a really nice way to remind yourself that when
our N phi, when our flux is at a maximum, when our coil is vertical, our EMF generated is actually zero. Also remember that your coil is undergoing circular motion here. And so you might have to figure out the time that it takes to go from zero to max using your circular motion equations. And also remember that there is a moment of the coil about an axis. So again, it could be linked in with the moments question. So let's have a look at this actual question and see what would we say as an answer to this. So hybrid vehicles use the same device both as a generator and as a motor for propulsion. The simplified diagram of the device is here. The coil can rotate freely around the axis. Describe how the device can be used as both a generator and an electric motor and it's six marks. So what they're trying to do here is help us get the six marks by dividing it up. So you want to go three marks for the generator and three marks for the motor. And just as we did in the preparation for this, let's go with motor first. Please do not think that you cannot use bullet points with this. Of course, it has a little star on it. It means you have to be coherent and logical in your response, use key terms, and link your responses together. That's all it means. It does not mean that you have to produce this as a beautiful paragraph of writing. So with, when it's a motor, we'll put in motor first, we provide the current. Just like we said when we were discussing this, you provide the current to a mo the motor. And what that does is it creates forces on either side. And in fact, I would go as far as to go put in your A, B and C, D. in here so that the examiner, the marker, knows that you know exactly which sides are going to have the forces on it. Those forces are perpendicular to the field. And I'm just going to use shorthand here. You would have to obviously write this out in an exam. These forces produce a moment around the axis. So the motor spins. Now, I've put in four points there. It is possible that you could condense these forces are perpendicular to the field and produce a moment. That might be the third mark. But in any case, because I've thought through it logically and I've separated my points out, I'm going to get the three marks for this because I have said everything that needs to be said. Now, what about the generator? Well, in this case, instead of providing current, we provide the motion. What this does is it changes the flux linkage with the coil. And any change in flux linkage induces an EMF. And this is where the key terms come in. It induces the EMF. And that word inducing is important. And the fact that it's EMF that's induced is important. We're not talking about current at this point, because if you look at that diagram, it doesn't actually have a full circuit on it. So current is not relevant. The magnitude of the EMF depends on the rate of change of the flux linkage. That's pretty much both motors and generators in a nutshell. But of course, all sorts of questions come up. So we're going to have one, a go at one more type of question and one that basically connects a lot of this stuff together. So here it is, we have a simple electric generator. Here's our graph, the variation of EMF with time t. Explain why the value of E varies between a maximum value and zero. And we've got to say four things for this, because it is four marks. Okay, so let's think about why does the value of EMF vary between a maximum value and zero? Okay, so the magnitude of the EMF because that's the value. The magnitude of the EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux linkage. We know that. So that's going to be our first point that we say. Our maximum value is caused when the coil is horizontal. Again, we saw that in the previous part of the video. When the coil is horizontal, we get the maximum rate of change of flux linkage and therefore the maximum EMF. Because, and we want to explain why, because at this point, the flux linkage is zero. And so any movement of the coil leads to an increase in the change. Conversely, when it's vertical, the sides of the coil 
are moving parallel to the direction of flux, and therefore n phi is at a max, and any movement produces very little change. So what we want to do is get that down in four marks. And again, the key to exam technique here is to stop for a second, have a think, count out the four points that you want to make, and make those four points. Just because there's an asterisk does not mean it has to be a paragraph. That means it's got to be logical and coherent. So coherence is lost when you start rambling on, when you haven't thought your points through. Explain why the area under the graph represents the change in flux linkage. So let's have a little look at the graph again. The area under the graph, and I'll just put in the area for a quarter turn because that's where it goes from max to zero. The area under the graph, just like any area under any graph, is y times x. So that's going to be e multiplied by t. Or in this case, the change in time. And that's what we're going to be writing down. Now we know that EMF, just magnitude, we're leaving out our negative sign at the moment. And if we cross multiply that, then we get, and of course that is equal to the area. And so that explains why change in flux linkage is equal to area. Then we have a straightforward calculation. We want the magnetic flux density, which is B. That's our n, and that's our area. Now, remembering that phi is equal to ba. So then we know that emf is equal to dnba over dt. And again, there is a minus in there, but in this case, we're trying to find the magnitude of it. So the minus just tells us the direction. It's not really relevant in this point. So we know what n is. We're looking for B, and we know what A is. So basically, we need to then find our area under the graph so that we get this, this, and this, so we can find B. And because we've just said the area under the graph is E dt. So let's have a look at the area under the graph. And again, we're going to do it for a quarter turn because that's where it goes from maximum to zero. So that's going to give us our total EMF. And to find the area under the graph, we need to count squares, knowing that each square is 2 volts times 1 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So 2 times 10 to the minus 3 volt seconds. There's 1, 2, 3. Effectively, that's 4. That's we can count as 1. 5. Now let's have a look at the others. This one plus this one up here would be another one. So that's 6 and that's a half a square. So we're going to say 6.5 squares altogether. 6.5 squares, each square is 2 times 10 to the minus 3. Giving us a value for the area of 0 0.013. So now we've got this. Now, all we're doing is substituting in and finding a value for B. When you're substituting in, do not rearrange your formula first, because there is a substituting mark. And if you incorrectly rearrange your formula and then substitute, you will not get the substitution mark. You substitute and then rearrange, and even if you do the rearrangement incorrectly, you still get the substitution mark. giving us a value of 0 0.0104 for Tesla for our magnetic flux density. Please remember to put units on everything. The only time where there isn't a mark taken away for not having a unit is if the unit is given in the question already, or it's a show that question. Any other time, a mark can be taken away for not putting a unit on it. So just get into the habit of always 
looking at a number and going, do I need to put a unit on this? Because most of the time you are going to have to put a unit on it. Okay, part C says the speed at which the coil rotates is halved. Sketch a graph of the axes below to show how the new EMF varies with time. Okay, so if the speed is halved, then the time is increased by 2. And remember that EMF is equal to tn phi dt. So if you increase the time, you're going to half the EMF. So our max EMF is going to decrease by half. And so we're going to end up with 4 volts. Now obviously, it's now going to take twice as long to spin. Instead of it taking 2.5 seconds to get to zero, it's going to take 5 seconds to get to zero, and then 5 seconds to get to minus 4, and 5 seconds to get to zero again. And so our graph is going to end up looking like that. So make sure that you have made it clear that you know it's 4 volts, and that it goes from 2.5 to 5 seconds. A force is required to rotate the coil. So that's when you turn the handle or something turns the handle. Explain why the size of the force increases when a lamp is connected to the output of the generator. And this is where Lenz's law comes in, that minus that's in that equation. As soon as you connect a lamp to the output of the generator, you are producing a current in that coil. As soon as you pass a current through a coil that is spinning inside a magnetic field, you get a force being produced on that coil. And because of that negative sign, the current and the force caused by the current are going to act to oppose the motion of the coil. That's what Lenz's law is. And so if you want to keep the coil turning at the same original speed, you're going to have to push harder to overcome that force that you're creating. That's you stopping and thinking before you write anything in the question. You then think, all right, how am I going to express this? I got two marks. Well, the first thing is that the complete circuit produces a current in the coil. And then we connect that current in the coil to a force opposing. Because it's only two marks, the amount of detail that we need to go into in order to explain that is not as great. In my next video, I'm going to do a question about induction, where it specifically asks you to reference Faraday's and Lenz's law to explain, and I will go into more detail on that in that video.